Uh, this is the special meeting of the Community Development Block Grant Committee, and this is a meeting where we are going to fulfill a promise that we made last year when we were dealing with the analysis of impediments that we would expand the CDBG committee to include members listed under Title VI of the, they call it the protected classes. We all hate that name, but that's the federal stipulation. And we're happy that we have had so many nominations and we're going to look at those, so many applications. We're going to look at those tonight. First of all, I want us to go down um, the line and introduce all the members here because we have some new council members that are just brand new. So why don't we start on my right with Linda? She's not a new council member, but go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. And my name is Linda Pfeiffer, and I'm with the City Council of uh, Sausalito. Good evening. I'm Kay Coleman, and I'm from San Anselmo. I'm now on the council. <laughs> Uh, Pam Hartwell Herrero, currently serving as the mayor of Fairfax. And my name is Andrew McCullough. I'm newly elected to the San Rafael City Council. And I'm Judy Arnold, Marin County Supervisor from Nevada. I'm Denise Athis, currently serving as mayor in the city of Nevada. I'm Carla Condon, and I represent the town council from town of Puerto Madera. I'm Ken Wachtel. I used to be mayor. No, 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 I'm just representing the city council. On this committee, I'm as old as dirt. I'm Sia Barman, uh, city council of Belvedere. So let me just give you a brief rundown, a brief history of, of how we ended up here tonight. We had a very busy year last year, and I want to thank the members of the subcommittee that attended almost all of the nine public meetings that we had on the analysis of impediments. Denise Athis from Novato, Ken Wachtel from Mill Valley, and former San Rafael City Council member Greg Brockbank. They've all served on this subcommittee and participated in most of the public meetings that we held. And they voted, and then all of the priority setting committee, or those of them who attended, um, approved the analysis of impediment implementation plan to be sent to the Board of Supervisors and at the meeting of the Board of Supervisors, it was unanimously endorsed. So now we are here trying to implement the promises that we made in the analysis of impediments implementation plan. Does everybody know about the analysis of impediments who's here tonight? If you don't, raise your hand and I can do a quick, okay, you all do. Uh, during the months of hearing on the analysis of impediments, a group of individuals under the umbrella of grassroots leadership was formed, and that's called the Action Coalition for Equity. Their uh, president here uh, is John Young, and they had members who were a tremendous help with us in navigating all of the issues that we needed to address in the analysis of impediments implementation plan, and they offered possible solutions. By expanding this committee, we are, comp we are complying with one of the requests that they made f to propose new ways of doing the people's business in this county. And that is by inviting a more diverse group of individuals to participate in our, de in our decision making. You know, I recently met some members of the original Tuskegee Airmen. And I remarked at a celebration for them in Novato last week that their mission of the Tuskegee Airmen was to protect white pilots from being bombed by the Germans, which they did and did well. But after their planes landed, they couldn't eat with those white pilots. And during the course of this anal analysis of impediments, I have discovered that discrimination didn't end when President Lyndon Johnson passed the Civil Rights Act, that, and it didn't end, nor when I marched with the civil rights in the 1960s. It's incumbent on all of us to be vigilant, to keep prejudice from creeping into our decisions and actions today. For us here at the CDBG meeting, it centers on fair housing and that overlaps with affordable housing. But the main emphasis in, we want to make this fair. Not only fair housing, we want to make this county a welcoming place for everyone. 
So this is our task tonight as we begin a new era and hopefully a more enlightened path in, in, in administering CDBG funding, pitiful though that funding is. It decreases every year and this year is the worst hit. At the February 16th meeting of the Priority Setting Committee, meeting members from each planning area um, are going to be asked to decide whether to expand their local area committee, and if so, the committee members from that planning area will select the additional members of this committee. You all have the list of the applicants from your local planning area, and whoever you pick, it was confusing with the chart when they filled out their applications to say local planning area or, or CDBG, what we're going to do is whoever you select tonight are going to be on their, um, of able to attend the local planning area and they will come and sit with us when we meet again in May. So at the same meeting, you're going to be asked to decide whether to expand and that's what you're going to be doing tonight. So there's going to be value in articulating general priorities and applying that lens to the application selection process, but without looking in overly specific priorities. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight, and I want to introduce the staff who's here. We have Brian Crawford, who is the head of the County Community Development Agency. Thank you, Brian. We have Roy Bateman, who heads the CDBG office, and we have Benita Shannon, who is one of the one and a half staff members that Roy has, who works very hard. And it's very complicated. So um, I would just like to then go uh, right now. We have open time for members, and this is for items that are not on the agenda. And do we have a do we have a microphone for the people who are going to speak? Um, do we have a handheld mic anywhere? I know it. I don't know where you know Andrew. Okay, yes, on you now. Um, I'm wondering if we could have them come sit down at, 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 in the chair and speak to us. That's it. Yeah. Is that one on where they, they can sit? Okay, they don't. Move. So if you if you want to come make a statement, could you please come sit down at the table here, and we all can see you. So anyone want to address address us on items that aren't on the agenda tonight? Yes, John. I'd like to bring to your attention. Um, you can sit down in the chair if you want to, because that other mic is on. And just pull it down. Um, no, no, you can't move one. They don't move. You got to use either one. Yeah. Use both. Well, I'd, I'd like to bring to your attention uh, the fact that um, the county does not have a, or the county, all the municipalities have any information delivery service uh, to foreign born and uh, there's considerable foreign born in this county. The county's changing, the, the demographics are changing and uh, I bring your attention because the fact is that they don't count here, they don't have voice, they're voiceless and uh, this group that I'm talking about is mostly Spanish speaking and there are a lot of Vietnamese there but um, the issue to me is communication you get information out about everything from rules, regulations, and things about police things and all that, but uh, it doesn't reach this group. This is a voiceless uh, group that doesn't uh, involve it in, in, uh, hasn't been involved in any kind of decision making. The principal reason is because planning, they're not part of the planning part. It's a whole community that's been ignored by the planners the planners are appointed by the city and county officials. So it's a form of discrimination being ignored like that. These people have needs, and these needs aren't being met in many ways at different levels. And um, if you're not, you're not part of a planning department, it means you're not, in planning planners, you're not a commissioner, a board member, or anything. You don't exist. And I just bring to your attention one more item, and that's the grand jury. 
The grand jury is apparently appointed by judges. Well, we've had 17 white grand jury members, good people, well-intentioned people. They meet twice a week and they investigate the county. Well, okay, but they're talking to each other. They're not talking about the people who are um, <laughs> the other part. And my point is this, and all these are good people. I have nothing against any of them. But my point is, again, that planning, planning, planning. And so uh, I'd like to bring that to your attention because this is certainly part of it. This protected group hasn't been considered. There's no plan. There's no communication to them, by them. There's no outreach to them. And uh, we don't know how to do it. That's the point. That nobody knows how to do it. So uh, um, just a couple weeks ago, the county uh, uh, put together a plan to public, uh, for public um, communication. And uh, this public communication plan was made by, um, well, by the county in conjunction with some of the county people in there. But again, it's uh, not specific how they're going to do it. And uh, so I bring this problem to you the municipality, because the county is attempting to address it. And I'd like to think about working as a partnership with the county, and uh, I, I'd like to think that they're way ahead. But um, these problems are local municipal problems. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Anyone else want to speak during open time? OK. Then we are going to go to the staff report. <coughs> yes, Ruby. <Rick. laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to welcome the new committee members. And I haven't had a chance to talk to all the new folks. Um, if anyone would like to stay after the meeting and just talk about CDBG in general, or if any new committee members want to stay afterwards, and, talk about questions they have about the process, I'm happy to do that. Um, the first part of the agenda is the selection of committee members, and I don't have a whole lot to say about that that's not in the staff report. Um, at this meeting, each of the CDBG local area committees have the opportunity to add one new member representing racial and ethnic minorities or people with disabilities. And the countywide priority setting committee can be expanded to add one or more people in, in, uh, to represent racial and ethnic minorities and people with disabilities. And then I, that's, I'll, I'll do the rest of the report under item number four. Um, okay. Do you want to uh, do you want to address the conflict of interest? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's the application form asked people about affiliations and whether they were involved with any organization that received or might be applying for either CDBG or home funds. There's a cover sheet on top of the applications that has a column indicating potential conflicts of interest. There were four individuals who I made notes about there. Um, I checked with the HUD staff that do the processing of conflict of interest exceptions, and their opinion was that everyone who I had a note for in that final column did have a conflict of interest that would require an exception from HUD. The process to get an exception from HUD would require the county to put together a request for the exception. There would need to be a public disclosure, typically a, a legal notice in the newspaper, a public hearing at the Board of Supervisors, and then we would have to submit a legal opinion from county council saying that the exception would not violate state or local law. And then there are a number of factors that HUD would consider in whether to grant the exception. The major ones would be whether the exception would provide a cost benefit or an essential degree of expertise that wouldn't otherwise be available, um, whether the affected person is 
a is a member of a group of low and moderate income people intended to be beneficiaries, and the exception would allow them to receive the same benefits that would be available to other people in that group. Whether the affected person has withdrawn from whatever functions or responsibilities triggered the conflict of interest. Whether the interest was present before the affected person was in the position that created the conflict of interest. And whether there would be undue hardship either to the community or the affected person if the exception isn't granted. And that has to be weighed against the public interest of avoiding the conflict. Um, the, the process takes probably a month or two at, at best. Tanya, do you want to sit at the desk where the microphone is in case I want, we want to ask you any questions? Brian, do you want to talk about um, the, what our county councils had to say about this? Yeah, we, we uh, queried our county, county council about the, the distinction between a conflict of interest for someone who sits as a, an employer or board member on a nonprofit that is applying for grant funding. And we've identified those individuals on the, the list of applications that um, you received in your packet. Um, our concern was about uh, any uh, similar conflict of interest for elected officials who um, work for a jurisdiction or serve a jurisdiction that receives federal grant funding. And if you read the, the Federal Code of Regulations uh, that uh, addresses the conflict of interest provisions, it does identify under persons that this conflict provision applies to as either employees or officers, not only nonprofit groups, but also uh, public agencies that receive grant funding. So our county council uh, assured us that the conflict of interest provision would not apply to any council member, town or city council member, um, that is representing a public agency that may receive federal grant funding as long as that individual isn't gaining any personal financial gain or benefit from it. So for example, if we were uh, making a grant fund to um, a company that a city council member, a town council member had an interest in, was a part owner of, that would clearly be a conflict of interest. But if the town council member or uh, city council member is simply representing their public agency in your capacity as a representative on this committee, then that is not a conflict of interest. So. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, yes. Maybe it's just uh, confusing for me, but why isn't it if someone, uh, even in that capacity, was on our committee, um, if it came time to uh, take a vote on things, why couldn't they just recuse themselves from that particular item as opposed to the way we would do it, if we have an interest? Uh, meaning if you stood to gain financially from a yeah. federal grant I mean, decision? Generally, if, if we have a conflict as council members, we remove ourselves from the room when it comes time to discuss that particular item. What? And I'm just wondering, why couldn't it be that way for these people? So that they wouldn't be voting on the monies going to their particular... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know of any um, provision or clause within the conflict of interest provision in the Federal Code of Regulations that would... Um, provide an exception for the recusal. I, I know intuitively it makes sense, and we, we asked ourselves that same question, but I don't believe the recusal would um, uh, avoid um, a, uh, a conflict of interest or potential conflict of interest. Yes. If I could add, under state law, the procedure is you recuse yourself, and, and that resolves the issue. You don't participate in the decision. Under the regulations of the CDBG program and the home program, um, that's not the procedure that's used. Conflict of interest in the HUD programs is defined very broadly, but there's a process for requesting an exception for HUD. So instead of a recusal, we have a broader scope of the conflict of interest provision when it's triggered. Um, but if it is triggered, there's a procedure to go to HUD and request an exception. Yeah, Council Member McCullough. So, if uh, if one were inclined to select someone here tonight who is listed as one of the conflicted applicants, could we do so provisionally? In other words, we would make the selection, that person would then go through the conflict of interest uh, exception process with HUD. If they were approved, then they could serve. If they weren't approved, 
then um, presumably in the provisional selection process tonight, we could pick a, a number two person to step in behind them. I don't see any problem with that approach. The, um, I also want to point out that you know we were very sensitive to this issue because, um, as Roy mentioned, the, the definition of conflict is very broad under the federal rules. Also, we're aware that um, if we were to appoint somebody and it was later found that, that someone had a conflict of interest, then the organization that they represent um, would not be eligible for grant funding, and we did not want that situation to occur, obviously. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, now we're uh, going to have public comment before we make our discussion and recommendations. At which time I'm going to take an antacid, so just come on up and speak and help yourself. <coughs> <laughs> it's been a long week. <laughs> I love, I'm Carrie Pierce from Mill Valley, and um, I love the idea of the provisional appointment, but I would ask that uh, the priority setting committee actually delay the decision. That a number of the people that are uh, called um, pre preliminarily uh, um, uh, conflicted uh, have not had a chance to, to, uh, to see whether they could be exempted. And I also think that while um, um, the conflict of interest for those of the, you that are sitting there, business might might apply to nonprofits. What Brian referred to as business, that if you're going to start applying this conflict of interest rule all of a sudden, I do think that you need to look at whatever uh, nonprofit boards and stuff that you serve on as well. It, it opens a whole can of worms. We spoke as ACE to another uh, division of HUD. They said they don't care a lick about what the, how a county does this. Apparently there's another division that does, but for many of the applicants, particularly the people of color that were encouraged to apply, it appears that this process has been made more difficult every step of the way. And it's almost seemed that way from, from the beginning, from the time our uh, CDBG department was found non-compliant. Also, Judy, thank you for going to see the uh, Tuskegee Airmen. I'm a proud son. And, um, and, and I, I really think that, that you might want to just reconsider whether to go forward with this, it seems to me that all of those that have been called preliminarily non-compliant should have the opportunity to uh, explore the, the exceptions. There's more exceptions than there are pro, uh, pro, uh, prohibitions in this document. So, thank you very much. With the committee's indulgement, I'm just going to answer uh, Carrie's, some of Carrie's comments. If, if we postpone this meeting, in order to meet in time to get our, our CDBG projects in to get the funding, we would have to hold a special meeting next week. Um, we've been struggling with this conflict of interest. We understand that you know it came as a surprise to us and that with the federal government, nothing's easy. I will say this, um, it is my intent tonight to, I know that the Action Coalition for Equity wants to be included in, this, in these committees. And, um, and, and you've had two, two of them apply. It's my intention tonight to nominate Nancy Johnson, who is a member of ACE, to be on representing the county. And I'm gonna do that um, under, with the, I understand that Nancy is, on a board, is a board member of a group that might receive some funding. So when someone applies and there's a, there's a, a potential conflict, there's, there's three, three choices you have. She could ask for an exception at HUD, which would probably take long, too long so that she wouldn't be able to vote. That's the problem. Or she could resign from the board, or the board could give up saying we, we don't want the funding. And so we're going to just go through that with her and see what happens, but at least she's going to be named to the committee and we're going to go forward. She should be nominated. She's going to be nominated. The board, the, my committee's going to vote. You, Judy, are you going to are, are you going to examine the uh, the, uh, the volunteer activities of all the people on the committee for, for their uh, nonprofit? I imagine that most. You of mean them, on our committee? Yeah, I, I, imagine, looking, them, I, I imagine. I don't want to get in a dialogue because we just. I want to just give three minutes to the speakers, but I will answer that. We, uh, we did, that's what we've talked to HUD about, that's what we've talked to County Council about today. 
when someone is elected and they and we vote for money to the nonprofits, unless we're going to be getting personal money, we're exempted because we're elected. But anyway, let's go ahead. It, it, let me have some more comments on this issue. I forgot my timer, but I'll be brief. I, okay. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is John Young. I'm the executive director of Marine Grassroots. Uh, just to kind of address what was previously mentioned is that uh, we are potentially a recipient of CDBG uh, grants. We put in applications, so I would like to formally rescind that application so that it does not uh, impact your decision about uh, qualified applicants that you may want to consider. So at this point, I'd like to rescind that. Uh, I didn't need to take the antacid then. My God. Okay, go ahead. Maybe you might be doing that <laughs> no. if she's selected and not before. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Okay, go ahead. So uh, there's a couple other things I wanted to mention is that uh, I have to also mention that I do have some uh, shared disappointment with some of the, my other colleagues that are here in the room because uh, as we've been working through this with the county supervisors and staff and trying to figure out a way how we could be more inclusive of people from the protected class and people from ethnic minorities, et cetera, that it seems that we're still at that tension to where we're being more exclusive than inclusive. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really disappointed that we're even having this conversation about how to exclude or include people. But I think that the bigger picture is, is that uh, from what HUD came in and said is that Marin needs to be a more welcoming community and that there needs to be ways that people from the protected class, and I hate to use that word, but I that's know. what you guys are using, <laughs> that people should be encouraged to sit where you all are and people, and there should be opportunities to support people getting to these seats in this community, not find ways to exclude them. And so my, my thoughts about that is that I'm, I'm kind of a little frustrated and disappointed that we're having this conversation tonight, but hopefully that as you look at the applicants that you have there and how you make your decisions, I would think that you want to make decisions based on being inclusive and not necessarily people that may agree with what you think is what you do, but more so to bring some good constructive dialogue into the room so that you understand more some of the barriers and challenges and issues that are going on in the communities that often many of you may not have time, have the opportunity to visit, partake in, or have uh, activities there. So uh, with that said, I'm hopeful that in moving forward that I'll echo what Kerry said is that I, I understand that there are some deadlines, but I would really appreciate that, that you guys consider, strongly consider, that we you delay the decisions of the appointments and do a little bit more due diligence because while there may be people that apply with that short window, but I'm sure there's a lot more people in the community that would be interested in, and, be, and be very enthusiastic about potentially being a part of this committee. It was just we had a short window and we just moved forward. But I, I know that there's this, uh, we have these deadlines and I know that, you know, HUD is actually to do this, but in the spirit of what HUD, I think what HUD would want is that they would want Marin to get it right not get it done fast, but get it done right. And I think that that should be your consideration, is to get it done right, not get it done fast. And uh, lastly, I'd just like to say that uh, you generously anointed me president of the Action Coalition for Equity. I am not the president of the group. I am Sorry. someone that, okay. that sits with everyone, my peers and all. So uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to clarify that. Thank, thank you all. For thank time. you. Sorry. Okay, anyone else want to speak? Dave. It has been a long week. <laughs> I, yes, sit far. down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, I don't roll over. Um, this has been. Um, a continuing process and I think there are um, cold and warm pieces on 
on all sides, whether or not it's staff or the committee or uh, the public or ACE, which I'm very proud to be a member of, but I'm not speaking tonight as a, as a member or in, in, to represent ACE. I think the, um, the issues about um, inclusion in Marin couldn't be more critical or emergent. And I think each of you um, are um, taking on a great responsibility, and I'm grateful for doing that. Uh, I know CDBG and home funds are minuscule. And I live in Corte Madera, and I understand that my city council has indicated um, basically um, a low tolerance for the hoo-ha that goes along with the CDBG and home funds. But that hoo-ha is nothing more than a, uh, a call in the wilderness for um, social justice. I think you all, because I've read it several times, do need to read Portrait of Marin, and despite Dick Spotswood, it is not a preconceived um, set of um, statistics that lie. It is a portrait of um, unhappiness on the part mostly of people of the protected class. Uh, they're the ones who are employed uh, in, in service jobs which are growing in a no-growth town. We all enjoy their work. We do not provide a community for them. The people who are here, the people who would otherwise be here if it weren't for, and I will be clear, um, segregated zoning. You could call it preferential zoning. But in fact, it's clear from a geographic examination of settlement patterns in Marin that there is at least the effect of exclusion. And the whole burden does not fall on each of your, each of your shoulders. Nevertheless, it is the federal government's purview to look at efforts at inclusion and communication with the protected classes. And frankly, despite our best efforts, those efforts at outreach from staff and to a certain extent from the Board of Supervisors continue to be lackluster. They don't meet deadlines. Um, and yes, we can take some responsibility for not continuing to bang on your door, but that's not our responsibility. The responsibility with analysis of impediments and the implementation plan is that it is in your collective interests by the federal government to do the outreach. And so, as, a, as an example of that, I would encourage you to delay the consideration tonight because of the brouhaha over the exclusion. But I am very grateful for Supervisor Arnold's outreach to Nancy Johnson in particular. I think um, that sort of gesture is um, a great example of the sorts of uh, exceptional actions that need to be um, taken over the next year or two if we're going to make the right steps in the right direction. I don't want to be a party to the wrong steps in the wrong direction. There's lots of opportunity for that. As we talked about Marin, I mean uh, Westchester, Marin, Westchester, Marin, sister mother, sister mother. Um, never mind, it's a cinematic reference. Um, it's um, Jack Nicholson in um, what was Chinatown. Thank you, bingo. Um, anyway, don't worry about that. It, um, Westchester and Marin are, I, we can go into it later. Uh, Westchester, Westchester and Marin are the two subjects of, of how the super scrutiny. Marin did not take the <coughs> negative road that Westchester did. And this implementation plan, our meeting tonight, is a result of that. I think we can, we, can, we can appeal to each other's better lights and take the action necessary to include people in the protect classes and, and reach out to provide a richer, more diverse brand. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Anyone else? Yes, Andrew. We're sorry we, we don't have, can't find the mic. I know you do. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Uh, one of the concerns I have is that we all assume that the county council's word is the last word. There's no evidence that the county council is absolutely right. So to decide not to go forward on a plan that you have made based on his interpretation without a written response, I, I, I'm not certain that is an action that uh, the county council gives advice, but he didn't cite any data that says one citizen is discriminated against another. You are also citizens of the county, and I'm a citizen of the county. And it's because of the fact that you are elected that you are therefore have a sanction. I find that violates my rights. And I think the council has left some very important things out there. I think that we all are people that are concerned, and concerned people can serve on more than one and take more than one action and not have a conflict and have the ability to recuse themselves. And so I, I find this information that you received about conflict just a little too lightweight. I really think there's more to it than that. And I think that I just don't see HUD saying to me that, for example, I'm on the Personnel Commission, that I could not, when we are on the Personnel Commission and we have conflicts, we recuse ourselves. We don't get off the commission. Uh, I, I, I've served on many boards and, 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 done, and been able to do it in a, a very fair and clear manner. And to say that because someone is on the board that may receive funds cannot be fair and open is very concerning to me. Uh, I think that limits who you get. And that's not what we're trying to do. I think we're trying to get people who want to serve the county in the best manner possible. And I think that you are eliminating people when you go with that. I would take the people that you chose and let the chips fall where they may. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. okay. Anyone else from Fire? Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Raphael. Um, I'm, um, I would like to also see either delay of this process or and rethink it. Um, when we formed that ACE group, uh, it was the county that actually told us that we were going to be working closely together as partners in this situation. Well, the way this is, is gone, it's, it doesn't really have that feeling. It doesn't feel like you guys will work with it. It seems more like you've managed us, especially with this piece, because I think we had already indicated that we wanted someone from our organization on that particular committee, on this particular committee, from the beginning. And I think at the beginning, you all knew where we made a living more or less, because we all have to make a living. So for, for you guys to find or use a way to exempt us from being on this committee seems, it makes me feel, I used to feel warm and fuzzy about you guys actually really sincerely wanting to work with us. But when you do things like this, when you, when you operate, we, I mean, we made a plan, an implementation plan that I thought that he, as soon as you send, send it to HUD that we were going to start basically working together and doing things to make sure that you included <coughs> the community and included the people of the low income and, and, and people of color. But it hasn't really worked that way. And I keep work, waiting for you guys to start that process. I mean, even this process, when it comes to the applications of people that, want to, that, that have the desire to be on, on this uh, committee, you haven't really included us even in, in that process. So I would really like to see you um, to, to basically postpone this until we can get this situation about the conflict of interest clear. Because secondly, the document that Roy has that actually speaks of the conflict of interest, it has exemptions down there, but, and there's nothing within that document that actually states anything about elected officials being exempt from that. That document doesn't say it. I don't know whether he got that from someone on the phone, but I would like to see a document that actually states that. 
Because the one that we have, that he has, doesn't. So that's, that's one of the things. As far as I'm concerned, I'm, I've been appointed by the ACE group as the um, Title VI Oversight Committee Chair. And we felt that, that, that this committee would be a perfect place for me to, to sit because of the fact that I'll be you know, involved in all the workings. I know that I can come to the meetings if I choose to, but that doesn't give me any voting power. For me to come to the meetings and have you still kind of basically control things and me just sit there like an oversight person without any type of opinion or being able to, to, to have a vote in any way, doesn't really work for, for, that, for, for me or the ACE group. So I, I just wanted to, to, to talk to you guys and let them know that, and I happen to be in, in the San Rafael area, and, um, and I would like to be appointed. And I just want to let you know. Thank, Thank you, you, Raphael. Anyone else? Yes. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Judy, for your support. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is to Roy, if I'm, if I may. Sure. Uh, reading the exceptions uh, under number two um, and Roman numeral number four. I'd like for you, to, Roy, please, to um, give me the definition of that particular statement. It says, whether the affected person has withdrawn from his or her functions or responsibilities, and I would assume that means re withdrawn from uh, a board or a potential conflict. But then it goes on to say, or the decision-making process with respect to the specific assisted activity in question. So can you explain to me, uh, does that not mean to abstain from participating in a vote or conversation that would be uh, regarding the person's uh, relationship with the, <coughs> with the board or a nonprofit? Uh, it could. Uh, I, it, it could. What HUD is looking for here is some indication of whether the person who has the conflict of interest is doing whatever they can to remove themselves from the situation that created the conflict of interest. So it could mean resigning from a board, it could mean quitting a job, it could mean uh, not going to a meeting where a decision is made. That's a factor that HUD considers when they make the determination of whether to grant an exception. But Unlike the state law, under the state law, if you recuse yourself, you've, you've, solved, you've pretty much have solved the problem if you, if you don't participate in the decision. HUD considers recusal to be one of the factors it considers in whether to grant an exception. Okay, and, and I, I'd just like to say, um, you, in your statement, you said that there was a cover sheet to the application for uh, this committee. And I have to say that I didn't receive that cover sheet when I filled out the application. And also on my application, I did indicate my um, involvement with Grassroots Leadership's board. So I, it, it was definitely made known. But if I had known that there was an opportunity to either uh, you know, write a letter or make a statement as to how I would participate on this board. I certainly would have done that if I had been informed of that. So, uh, and, and so that brought up the question for me, or the decision-making process with respect to the specific assisted activity in question. So that tells me that there is an opportunity to serve on a board and also be able to serve on the priority setting, com setting committee. Thank, Thank you, Nancy. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Come on, Jim Bob. You Bob. I know. Uh, I'd like to be short, short and sweet. Uh, for a lot of us who are older, uh, we talk about civil rights like it was something in the past. Uh, you're in the middle of civil rights right now. I'd like you to look at all the choices that you would make if you were alive during the 50s and 60s and where you'd stand then. I'd ask you to stand in that same place today as we move forward and put people on this position. Uh, it's a shame that we have to 
uh, keep pushing people away. We boards tend to clone themselves, and it'd be nice to get some different people in there. Uh, the book out, The New Jim Crow, I think it's all required reading of everybody involved in changing our lives. Uh, so. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Hello, my name is Miriam Alfonso, and uh, I would be honored to um, um, participate in this uh, committee as a Latino and single mother uh, living in this county. Um, I don't uh, represent any um, organization, uh, just as a member of the community. Thank you. Um, uh, where is Miriam also? Oh, Milvada. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to close then the public hearing. I'm going to bring it back to the board and uh, or to the committee. And so I would, uh, before I hear your questions and your comments, let me just say that um, uh, in regard to the, the statement that the county council made a ruling, the county council only looked at does our board have conflicts. The other rulings came from HUD, which, which we have here. Also, I just wanted to, to note that we have many applicants for this that are very diverse, that represent the whole, um, the whole spectrum of, um, of the protected class. And I, I was pleased to see this many, and I want to thank everyone who applied and everybody who, who asked people to apply. But let me get questions and comments from the committee. I'm going to start with my left. Okay, Carla, you first, and then you can. Okay. Um, I have a. Okay. Ooh. I have a question to Roy. Um, Roy, we have had no applicants from the Lower Ross Valley, and could you perhaps give me an idea of what the consequences of that might be? Well, each of the planning areas has the opportunity to add an additional member. Since there weren't any applicants from the Lower Ross Valley, um, it doesn't seem like to be a way to add a member to that committee unless you tap somebody from outside the area. Um, however, what really counts to HUD is the countywide committee, and there certainly are plenty of options to add members to the countywide committee. So I, I don't think it would be an issue at all for compliance with HUD or compliance with what we promised to do in the implementation plan for the analysis of impediments. Okay, and, but down the road, um, are we still eligible to uh, get, to have somebody added to um, the group that's with us today that want to participate? I'm assuming that this will be a continuing process in the same way that city representatives change from time to time. Okay, thank you. Ken. Yeah, I'd just like to remind people who, I guess, were at the meeting in the uh, Santa Fe, and those of you who were not yet elected and are here now, that one of the issues I raised when the first, when the first suggestion was made to have a um, an additional member on the committees is that, in my mind, the people who would be most interested and probably the most valuable on the committee were the people who actually participated in the programs. Uh, and as it turns out, that, that's true, but what we did envision at the time was that that category of, of person might very well be excluded from, from serving. So insofar as our first envisionment of what this was going to be, I guess it didn't really work out that way. Um, or hasn't so far. My view right now is it's a new it's a new design. I would go forward with this. Uh, it may not be perfect. I would go forward with it tonight. It may not be perfect. Um, it's the first time we've sought to add membership outside of councils, um, and I might suggest the first. Member be, members be on a one-year term so that we can actually figure out the strengths and weaknesses and how to propose this uh, the next, next year when it comes up. Um, we're not, but I think we ought to start it. I think starting is better than doing nothing. Um, I think that um, I don't see anybody as having a vested 
interest in being a member. I, you know, I, I don't. I'm not a part of any of the negotiations made go forward or discussions. I, I see everybody here on an equal, equal stage, equal basis. That uh, we look at the questionnaire. I guess we discuss it. However, we're going to go about it. But I don't give anybody a vested interest in being on any committee. I do, however, have a question that if anyone would like to address on the board, that it might very well help me. Um, when I first heard of this process, my first consideration was that we were going to be looking at people who were applying, who are actually okay, persons who are more on the receiving end of the type of funding and services that CDBG provides. People more on the, the disadvantaged, I don't know, these may not be perfect words, yeah. more on the disadvantaged side Twice. so that they could add something that maybe we aren't familiar with. Uh, I still think that's a good reason. I do see, however, in the applications that we have a certain number of people who are on the administrative side, or what I would, design, I would designate as administrative side, who, whereas, being, whereas not being people who are on the recipient category, are more in the directorial administrative side, I think both categories have something to add and something to help. Mm -hmm. I just don't know which side to choose. I, I just don't know which side to put the emphasis on. I mean, my first idea was not the administrative side, mm -hmm. but we have some excellent mm -hmm. people who I could learn from mm -hmm. on the administrative side. So if any of you have anything that you could help me and maybe help all of us into, into getting a, a, a background or a view or, a, or some insight as to how we really want to carry this out, that would help me. Thank you. Okay. Denise. Um. I, I agree with you, Ken, and I, I actually am really frustrated with the fact that once again um, we're kind of put in the position of fighting for our own local control and what we want to do and how we want to do it. Um, we were put into this position because uh, the government said that we weren't compliant. So then we go to extremes to try and be compliant. Um, I, think, I think we've done a really good job in trying to embrace everybody in, try, in, in this, and now that we have the opportunity to put these people in place, we're being told again that there's some you know, terminology that isn't working correctly that's going to keep us from forming what we want to do in Marin. You know, so how we fight that, I don't know. It's added to the list at this point um, you know, with government, but I kind of am of the opinion too, I would rather start the process um, then delay it and then try and fight try and fight the government on what we want and not make this a permanent thing but make it it's sort of you know uh, fire ready aim you know at this point you know and, and let's just get it on the plate so that we can start having a conversation even if it's not perfect yeah. and then try and make it perfect you know for the next for the next round okay good right and yes Andrew Mm -hmm. I've got a question and then um, a comment. If I can address my question to you, Roy, um, am I right in understanding that our goal tonight is to, each of us, or from each of us representing a particular local area, <coughs> is to select, or, or nominate rather, someone for that local area, and then that nominee, should that person be selected, would then serve also on the countywide priority setting committee, that is this committee. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. So to the extent there's any confusion in who applied for what, when we look at the boxes checked, we can figure that out in our nomination process. Mm -hmm. I think there was, from my contact with the applicants, I think there was enough confusion about which box should be checked to indicate what the, my best advice would be to ignore the, the boxes. Okay. And of course, the committee can also appoint at large members in addition to uh, adding one person for each planning area. So, thank you, Roy. So, my, my comments are simply the, the public comments that we've heard, I find very sympathetic and very compelling. And what I'm hearing in particular are sort of two strains of thought on this conflict issue. One is that the conflict the way it's framed by HUD is inappropriate. It acts as an exclusionary bar to people who are otherwise very well qualified and appropriate to serve. 
The other is that we can get around this uh, potentially either by fighting the conflict, going through the exemption or waiver process with HUD, or we can delay this, these proceedings and go out and find more qualified people in the community who don't present such a conflict. To answer the latter strain first, I, I think I concur with what I'm hearing um, up here, and that is to delay it might jeopardize our ability to get the job done. That is to make sure that these funds, in fact, flow to the community in a timely fashion. And I would hate to jeopardize that when we look at next week, if next week is, in fact, uh, our deadline to reconvene in a special meeting. That would be problematic since next week for many is a vacation week, or some people may be on vacation. So I'd hate to see this slide. On the other issue, I mentioned earlier the potential for uh, provisional selections. I think that may be the way to go, uh, in, consistent with what Ken and Denise have said about perhaps um, shortening the tenure that we're um, expecting for these folks, but also expecting uh, that in the waiver or exception process, we're going to find that these very qualified people who on the sheet of paper might be conflicted, might in fact be able to serve, and I'd like to see that happen. <coughs> okay, thank you. Pam. Um, we've heard a little bit about the recruitment window being short. How long was the recruitment window? If there is a delay, does it, does it, do we feel like, um, A, what, you know, I think maybe like, what's the impact on the programs that we're looking to fund? Um, and, um, and is there a sense that we would get applicants that didn't have these conflicts, but that were still representative of the kind of people that we're looking for? That, I mean, I guess, firstly, what's the, what's the impact of delay? On the, on the programs that we're looking to fund? I think the main impact of delay is that we would um, not be able to add new members until after the funding cycle this year. Mm -hmm. So they would come on after we've had our hearings about how to allocate the next round of funding. How, how long and how extensive was the recruitment process for these positions? I don't recall the date it was posted. It was January 16th, I believe, it went out. January 4th, I think. Oh, it went out. Yeah. Well, that's when the letter went to the cities. I don't recall when the recruitment was posted on the website. Do you have ESK? Oh, wait. Um, that's okay. You can move it. No, no. There's never really been any problem. When you're the teacher of boys, you don't have that problem. <laughs> I'm very new to this. I sat in at the last session uh, when Barbara Thornton was ill, and I was very moved by the desire for participation of individuals and of individuals who represent organizations. And uh, I said to myself, where have these people been? Where are these people? And, it, and I think that's what has come out of the analysis of impediments is that we need to find out where people are who want to be heard, we want to hear that story, we want to see what the contact is. We want to, this is not something that's written in stone, I don't think. I mean, it's, a, it's an amorphous thing that we will figure out how to work it, but I don't want to lose any money um, because we think that we're not, in, you know, haven't got it perfect. It's not going to be perfect. But at least it's a start, and I certainly don't want to lose any money. We're getting such a piddly amount of money to begin with that I don't want to lose any and, and by putting it off. That's my, that's my real main concern. And the, I would propose a two-year, just speaking from being a new council person, you know, you barely learn everybody's name, and, and you know, then it's time to say goodbye. So, I, you know, so we'll figure out how to do it and how to include the people who are interested, the people who want to serve, and let's get it going. Let's do it. Okay, Linda. Uh, thank you, Judy. So, um, in listening to all of this, uh, I guess what strikes me is that as, you, as everyone knows, a conflict of interest um, doesn't mean that it exists. It just means that there is the perception of a conflict of interest. 
And we've, what I'm sensitive about is that we've just had our funding cut. Uh, we're in the public eye. Uh, we want to turn this around. We want to get more funding next year. We, we don't want you know, controversy. We want to be able to help these nonprofits that we have been helping uh, to achieve their vision. And so um, I think that we need to uh, proceed with, with guidance on this, on this issue. Um, just because I, I, I want to make sure that we are, you know, following the guidelines that, you know, HED has sent uh, down a place before us. And um, I'm, just, I'm just sensitive to the, uh, the fact that I want CDBG to be successful and to continue to, to grow and hopefully reverse the decline that we've experienced this year. Um, because I, I want us to be able to help those, those agencies that are they want to get more more involved, but um, so I'm I'm a bit cautious okay. about this. All right. So from what I hear from the comments, it sounds like there's consensus on this committee to go forward with the selection.